So here in the book of Ezekiel chapter 29, we're going to talk about the prophecies of Ezekiel for Egypt. Jeremiah prophesied about Egypt as well. We're going to see what Ezekiel is going to prophesy about them also. Verse 1, in the 10th year, in the 10th month, in the 12th day of the month, the word of the Lord came unto me saying. So now realize if you're if you're following along the book of Ezekiel, going through all these videos, you realize just a few chapters ago, it was the 11th year. And now it's the 10th year. So this is a revelation that actually came before the previous ones about Tyre and, and Zidon. Uh, so just, you know, they're not in chronological order when, when they compiled the book of uh, Ezekiel together. Verse 2, Son of man, set thy face against Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and prophesy against him and against all Egypt. Now, Erdman, in his handbook of the Bible, said, By his insufferable pride in placing himself among the gods, Pharaoh has exposed his whole land to God's anger, but he will learn who is God. So remember, Tyre, the king of Tyre, set himself up to be a god. Pharaoh in Egypt oftentimes set themselves up to be a god. They were usually seen as either the son of God or the God as well. Uh, verse 3, Speak and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, the great dragon that lieth in the midst of his rivers, which has said, My river is mine own, and I have made it for myself. So this guy believes in himself as a god so much, he's claiming the Nile as his river that he made for the benefit of his people. Uh, verse 4, But I will put hooks in thy jaws, and will cause the fish of thy rivers to stick unto thy scales. So he's talking about this idea of the Pharaoh is a dragon and the and he's going to put a hook. He's going to catch the dragon, basically. I will bring thee up out of the midst of thy rivers and all the fish of thy river shall stick unto thy scales. I will leave thee thrown into the wilderness. Thee and all the fish of thy rivers, thou shalt fall upon the open fields. Thou shalt not be brought together nor gathered. I have given thee for meat to the beasts of the field and to the fowls of the heaven. So they are going to be destroyed and left basically for the wild animals to take them out. They'll kill the dragon, and the dragon will be consumed by the other animals. The fish, the other people that were in the sea, are going to be left out on the shore and all die and be left there for food for the land animals, basically, and the fowls of heaven, the birds. Uh, verse 6, And all the inhabitants of Egypt shall know that I am the Lord, because they have been a staff of reed, to the house of Israel. They have now staff of reed to the house of Israel uh, is think of like 2 Kings 18, this idea of um, so 2 Kings 18, let me read this. Now behold, thou trusteth upon the staff of this bruised reed, even upon Egypt. This is in 2 Kings, this is Israel being told. Egypt is no longer a world power. They are like a broken reed. Their stick is broken, and they're not going to be there anymore. And so that's that's the, they're trying to warn them again. Jeremiah tried to warn them too to say, guys, Egypt isn't the same power it used to be. They're not going to be able to win against Babylon. Don't rely on them. Basically is what it is. Number seven, when they took hold of thee by thy hand, thou didst break and rend all their shoulder, and when they leaned upon thee, thou breakest and madest all their loins to be a stand, or to come to a standstill, basically. Uh, so they're not going to be a support. They're, they're fake. They're hollow. They don't have, they're not a world power anymore, basically. Egypt is still there, but they're not necessarily powerful. They can't really influence the world anymore. Uh, verse 8, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will bring a sword upon thee, and cut off man and beast out of thee. And the land of Egypt shall be desolate and waste, and they shall know that I am the Lord, because he has said, The river is mine, and I have made it. So even though this Pharaoh thinks he's made it, he's going to die and realize, Nope, I, God, has made it, basically, the God of creation. Uh, verse 10, Behold, therefore I am against thee and against thy rivers. I will make the land of Egypt utterly waste and desolate, from the tower of Cyrene even to the border of Ethiopia. So this is a city in southern Egypt, Cyrene, to the border of Ethiopia, which was south of them, basically. 
verse 11, No foot of man shall pass through it, nor foot of beast shall they pass through it, neither shall it be inhabited forty years. So this whole area of southern Egypt is going to be just gone, a wasteland, completely desolate. Uh, verse 12, And I will make the land of Egypt desolate in the midst of the countries that are desolate. And her cities among the cities that are laid waste shall be desolate forty years. And I will scatter the Egyptians among the nations, and will disperse them through the countries. So that even the Egyptians are going to be scattered around the known world, basically, at that time. Verse 13, Yet thus saith the Lord God, At the end of forty years will I gather the Egyptians from the people whither they were scattered. And I will bring again the captivity of Egypt, and will cause them to return into the land of Pathros, into the land of their inhabitation. They shall be there a base kingdom. So this is, Pathros is southern Egypt. So they're going to return eventually. They'll be gone, scattered for 40 years. Then they'll come back, and they will be a nation again, but no longer a nation of any significance, basically. And that's kind of, if you think about it, that's, I mean, Egypt isn't much even today. There's not much there. They Most of their wealth and fortune is tourism from the understanding ancient Egypt. But they don't have, like, they're not a world power. They're not, if it wasn't for being a member of the UN, they wouldn't have any say in anything going on, basically. Um, so this has been very true for them. Now, verse 15, it shall be the basest of the kingdoms, neither shall it exalt itself any more above the nations, for I will diminish them. They shall no more rule over the nations. Boy, has that been true since then. Holy cow. Uh, it's 16, and it shall be no more the confidence of the house of Israel, which bringeth their iniquity to remembrance when they shall look after them, but they shall know that I am the Lord God. So again, Egypt and Israel will no longer be alliance together. And, and today they're not. Egypt has gone Arab. They're more of an Arab nation. And so they are, the, in a way, the enemies of, of uh, Israel at this time. Uh, verse 17, it came to pass in the seventh and twentieth year, in the first month, uh, in the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, so this is seventh year, seventh and twentieth year, sorry, so 27 years. So this is quite a ways after the exile most likely, the, his exile, uh, which was around uh, 597-ish BC, basically. Uh, verse 18, Son of man, Nebuchadrezzar, king of Babylon, caused his army to serve a great service against Tyrus. Every head was made bald, every shoulder was peeled, yet had he no wages, nor his army, for Tyrus, for the service that he had served against it. So now, what this is talking about, uh, and this is, you can see this, Adam Clark's The Holy Bible with a commentary and critical notes mentions, Nebuchadnezzar had not been able to conquer the island city. When the long siege of Tyre was ended, many of the Tyre Tyrians loaded their wealth on their ships and escaped to Carthage. Thus, Nebuchadnezzar lost some of the spoil of one of the world's richest cities. So that's what he says, he had no wages to pay his army. So a lot of times it's like, if we're going to win, if we want to be victorious, you know, we got to win this thing. If we want to have pay, we got to win. He went out there, put all this out to, you know, have all his people come out to fight and feed him and take care of him. And they lost. They couldn't get tired. And so that's, that's what's happening right here, basically, is Nebuchadnezzar's kind of defeated because they couldn't get tired. Verse 19, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will give the land of Egypt unto Nebuchadrezzar, king of Babylon. He shall take her multitude, and take her spoil, and take her prey, and it shall be the wages for his army. So he's going to get Egypt now, after Tyre, and then he'll be able to recoup his army and his, his wealth, basically. Uh, verse 20, I have given him the land of Egypt for his labor, wherewith he served against it, because they wrought for me, saith the Lord God. So, because because Babylon did what I wanted to do against Tyre, I'll give them the spoils of Egypt as a compensation. Uh, verse 21, In that day will I cause the horn of the house of Israel to bud forth. Meaning power and capacity, basically. I will give thee the opening of the mouth, which is an idiom meaning authority to speak, in the midst of them, and they shall know that I am the Lord. So this will be a good day when Babylon can take Egypt, actually is the beginning of, opportunities for Israel. This could be at the point where you know Nebuchadnezzar takes Egypt, but then shortly after that, 
they fall to Persia is probably what this is prophesying and talking about, basically. But we're going to see that as we get into later chapters and later discussions as well. So I hope you're enjoying these videos. If you are, please like and subscribe to our channel. Comment. I'd love to hear your comments and thoughts as you go through and study the Old Testament. Uh, and please share the links out to your friends and family and others to help them to learn more about the scriptures also. Thanks. We'll see you in the next chapter.